Yeah, so welcome everybody here to this uh, second uh, Healthcare Insider uh, webinar uh, series that we've begun a couple of months ago. The first session we had uh, around COVID-19 uh, with Dr. Prem, our CEO uh, here in Singapore, with Erica, our hospital uh, CEO in uh, Malaysia, and Dr. Leong Ho Nam, uh, uh, a pronounced uh, expert in vaccinations uh, here in Singapore and, and the whole region. Today, uh, I have uh, three colleagues with me. We want to discuss uh, a very, very different topic. Um, but maybe as a background to this Healthcare Insider series, uh, we've started this as a platform for capital market uh, participants, for media, for analysts, for investors, uh, for banks, and we've opened it now to a little bit of a broader group of participants, and I want to welcome uh, all our IHH colleagues uh, who have dialed in today uh, to join us in this discussion. As usual, uh, there are uh, there's the opportunity to ask questions, put this in the chat bot, uh, and we'll at the end of this uh, come to this. We have a couple of uh, a QA in, in, in the in the progress. And please don't be surprised, I have my phone here. This is a, a, a webinar for a digital transformation. So of course I have my my phone here with apps on it and uh, all the communication tools. Um, let me uh, introduce our panelists. Uh, first of all, our CEO, uh, Dr. Kelvin Lo. Hi everyone. Uh, we have uh, Dr. Kenneth Tsang in Hong Kong, who is joining us uh, 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 online. Hello, everyone. And we have from uh, McKinsey, uh, Sachin Chaudhary, uh, who has joined us today uh, to join and, and share a little bit the outside in perspective Hello, in, this, uh, in this topic. Look, the topic uh, is around digital health, digital transformation. I think we want to take the broadest possible perspective uh, uh, out of this. I want to discuss a little bit how COVID-19, the pandemic, potentially has accelerated uh, uh, the move towards uh, digital transformation, uh, how IHH is managing it. We want to hear a little bit about uh, how others in the industry uh, are dealing with this. But, but Kelvin, you, 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 have a, you have a health app on your phone? Uh, of course I do. I'm in, in Singapore, so I have a Parkway Digi Health app uh, with me right here. Oh, fantastic! Fantastic. And, and are you are you getting prescriptions on it, or are you you're taking telemedicine consultations, or or how, what do you use it for? Navigating my healthcare, booking my health screening. And sure. Fantastic! Fantastic. So we we I already have one client here uh, uh, who's spearheading it. Um, but before we discuss among us. Uh, let's ask the question to the audience. Um, have you used telemedicine tools uh, before? Uh, yes, I have. No, and no, I don't want to use it. Um, so please, please give your answers now. We see the, uh, the scores running up and actually quite interesting. Uh, really a clear majority uh, says, uh, no, I, I have not, but I may do so in future. So I guess there's some entry barrier, there are some things we can discuss. Uh, actually a third or 30% of the participants say, uh, yes, I've used it, so that's great, welcome. Uh, but there is 7%, uh, nearly 10% of uh, participants here say, no, I have not, and I prefer in-person consultation. So there are people with concerns. Kenneth, what is the take-up rate on telemedicine in Hong Kong right now? Um, thank you, Yo. We have actually two platforms that we are using right now. The first one is what we call the Glen Eagle Virtual Consultation. We have been preparing for telemedicine since 2019. And we were hoping to launch it in late 2020 at that time. Uh, however, because of the outbreak of the pandemic in 2020, um, we started providing virtual consultations for some of our specialist services 
so that our patients can have an option for not coming into the hospital for follow-ups. For example, in oncology, gastroenterology, hepatology and cardiology. And over time, we have extended it to some other specialties such as psychiatry and orthopedics as well. Overall, we have seen increasing utilization of this service compared to 2020 when the pandemic first started. And currently, patients using the service are mostly seen in this, these same uh, service uh, specialties. But in terms of numbers, it's more interesting to look at the, de um, the developments for the Dr. Go platform, which is a platform that we are partnering with a teleconsultation company, uh, sorry, telecommunication company in Hong Kong. Um, so far, we have launched the GP services and the family medicine services, and also the COVID-19 test services. Uh, recently, we also started a hypertension care program as well. But the interesting thing about this um, uh, platform is that we have already had 250,000 Hong Kong clients downloaded the app. And for Glen Eagle Hong Kong, there has been a month on month growth in the number of users as well. Majority of them were looking for GP services. If we just focus on episodic diseases like upper respiratory tract symptoms, our numbers are up for maybe around threefold already since the start of the year. Uh, absolute numbers are not telling a good story for us in JHK because the hospital is still ramping up. But if we look at the percentage increase in the number of attendants, it rose from 1% of our total A&E activity in January to become 3% in August this year. Look, I mean, you're, you're tracking already the number of uh, subscribers, so this is really looking like a pretty patient-focused uh, approach. You're tracking the downloads uh, and how many people participate. 250,000, that, that sounds actually like a, a pretty huge number. Kelvin, you have something overall for IHH? So IHH launched telemedicine services in all our countries uh, in May last year. Um, different countries have different tick-up rates. I think that's a natural uh, situation because of the geographical spread, the size of the country. Uh, in a country like India, for example, we saw at the height of COVID that teleconsults went up to somewhere between 10 to 20 percent at the peak um, of all consultations uh, in India. Sachin, if I, if I ask you about the industry, is there a, has there been a change? Uh, uh, I would assume there has been, but do you have some outside numbers? Yes, uh, so th there was a significant change uh, as COVID started. There was a, if I remember, 300% increase uh, on the consultation uh, 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 post-COVID. Um, and I think one interesting point to note here, uh, Jorg, is it's not only just the increase in number, but if you look at the, uh, if we have, we have surveyed HCPs in different parts of the world, around two thirds of the HCPs are saying that uh, we expect this rate to remain same or go up uh, in future. So that tells you that level of adoption that has taken place during COVID is massive. And this has really accelerated the whole digital health and uh, telehealth uh, journey uh, across the globe. So I mean, good, final results, uh, uh, more than 60% of participants say they plan to use telemedicine and digital services in the future. 30% uh, nearly say they have already used it. 10% uh, are hesitant, and, and we'll come back to that uh, a, a little bit later. Maybe getting back, Sachin, to you again, help us a little bit to delineate the topic digital health, telemedicine as a subset of it, but it's a broader topic. Can you help us? What are different models? How do people engage with this? Yes. So uh, while there is no agreed taxonomy uh, that is widely used, but the way to think about this is uh, telehealth is almost the first step on the journey to digital health, right? Where you are essentially uh, getting access to care through a phone or text or video. Uh, the next step, next logical step in the journey is virtual, uh, virtual care. In the virtual care, you add few other things on the telehealth uh, that, that you're offering, for example, remote monitoring. So whether it is oximeter, blood glucose monitoring and all that, right? So you include some uh, uh, remote monitoring devices on top of telehealth. And the overall umbrella, uh, uh, if, if, if I may, 
is digital health. Digital health essentially is a personalized health ecosystem for a patient with a set of services around the patients that are seamlessly interconnected, the data that seamlessly flows and connects with each other. That, that's the, that, that, that would be a way to uh, uh, classify digital health. And it goes all the way from sort of the research that takes place around it to screening, to well, wellness screening, care delivery, and sort of the other enablers uh, in making it successful, uh, right? So that, that would be the overall digital health uh, umbrella. I would assume that different countries have a different speed in adopting this, in uh, embracing this. Who are the leaders and where is Asia or Southeast Asia in this journey? Yes, that's a very good question. Uh, indeed, uh, there is a different uh, speed on adoption of overall digital health across the world. Uh, there was a lot of experiment that took place in the West, especially in the US, uh, uh, as payers push for uh, innovation around, around, uh, around care delivery as well. But over the last decade, and especially in the last few years, there is a lot of innovation that has taken place in this part of the world as well. So if you look in Asia, China, uh, you do see several ecosystems that have emerged and providing um, uh, 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 digital healthcare the way, the way I was just describing it. And in addition, several other uh, geographies within Asia itself, whether you take, for example, India, as uh, Kevin was saying earlier, there is a lot of interest and push that has taken place in the last just few years, especially around COVID, uh, uh, that, that, uh, where the adoption has been. So there is a wide, a wide range. My belief, by the way, is this is one area where Asia can really leapfrog uh, the world in terms of delivering of the overall digital health. So you would say Asian patients or Asian consumers have a natural tendency to innovate or embrace digital technologies faster? Yeah, there are two, ang two angles to it, Jorg. It's not only the patient, it's I think the need as well. Uh, mm -hmm. In terms of where the care uh, overall overall journey in different markets is in terms of where the sophistication of care delivery has been, there is a need for innovation in Asia. Uh, the number of beds per 10,000 are less compared to OECD countries. Uh, the percentage of GDP that goes into healthcare uh, is, is lower than OECD countries. And in that situation, uh, as you've seen over the last uh, decade or so, there's a lot of innovation that is looking to fill the gap and digital has really emerged as one of the key innovation to enable it. So that's one part of, uh, to the story. The second part is indeed the patient. The, the overall penetration of mobile phones, access to internet, and the population in Asia is, is highest, uh, as, as we know. Uh, that is also enabling, enabling um, uh, the penetration of digital health in a, in a sort of a faster, faster rate, right? Because there, there is a population that is looking for care. They are learning about access to digital tools in different industries. And a lot of innovators, uh, some healthcare as well as non-healthcare innovators are now filling that gap by pro providing those services for the patients. Okay, so I hear healthcare uh, or health ecosystem, I hear personalized, which means there is more focus on the person, on the patient, or maybe on the customer, if we call him that. Kelvin, you've spearheaded this topic in IHH. Uh, how does IHH respond to this? How are you responding to these challenges where it seems clear that other players, even tech players, uh, are putting a bet into this? Mm -hmm. how, how, what are you doing? So IHH is a global healthcare company and we remain focused as what we have always have to put patient in the center. And so our approach to uh, digital health or digital technologies is to use it to simply make healthcare better for our patients. What do I mean? Now, we provide excellent clinical care in our hospitals. Patients come for acute treatments. For example, the patient with uh, appendicitis that comes in the middle of the night, a patient who has a constant headache and realizes there's a brain tumor that needs to be taken out, a cancer patient that needs to go for chemotherapy. These are treatments that will continue to require care in our hospitals, but digital technology enables us to service our patients much better, deliver care 
in a more convenient way, empower them better, and also create more customized care. So meaning to say, we should embrace digital technologies to create an ecosystem that is seamless in both the online space to the offline space that is in our bricks and mortar setting to make sure that, uh, 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 but not, not digital for digital sake, to make sure that keeping the patient in the center, we are using this or we are doing this to make care that's more convenient, care that uh, if you can do teleconsult uh, versus a physical consult, uh, if you can get information, uh, exchange information with, your, with, with our hospitals, with our common hospitals, why not? We should do that online. Book appointments uh, more seamlessly, follow up care, maybe even deliver drugs. Uh, so that's what we should do, embrace these technologies, um, we are going to invest strongly into it so that we are making care better for the patient, better convenience. And then we empower them, right, because they have now this information, we are going to make uh, choices more clearly known to them, uh, let them understand the healthcare journey better, and therefore empower them, put the power back in the hands of patients to decide, help them decide on their care. And finally, uh, technology will continue to advance. I'm of the firm belief that we can use the advanced tools, whether in AI, uh, data analytics, to drive decision making such that we deliver care now to the individual patient, uh, customize his journey, um, as well as customize uh, the care, the clinical care to the individual patient. You've invested into Doctor Anywhere in this journey is one of the very early anchor investors. Is this your strategy to work through partners and invest in others and let them or do you believe we as IHH play a role here too and, and, and we need to build our own capabilities? So the answer is we'll do both. Uh, and the reason is we are first and foremost a healthcare service provider and if we focus first uh, by keeping in the patient center, in the patient in the center, then our goal uh, is to find the find the best possible tools, right, to take care of the patient. Um, in in the world of diagnostics, uh, as diagnostics advance uh, from X-rays, you have MRIs, uh, from MRIs you have PET MRIs. Of course, we went around buying those technologies in uh, in the in the laboratory space, for example, when we found that. Um, we can actually diagnose cancer in a much more simple, cost-effective way via blood uh, draws. We invested in a liquid biopsy company, that's Lucens. And Doctor Anywhere is no different. A Doctor Anywhere is a digital uh, ecosystem or digital platform, sort of an e-commerce space which caters to wellness patients, enables patients to connect much better. They had some capabilities we didn't have uh, from the, their very early days, and therefore we were pleased to make a strategic investments and create that complementary, uh, uh, use their technology to create complementary care for our patients. What, what you're basically saying is that the healthcare industry historically has always been a highly innovative industry at the absolute forefront of science. And you're now expanding this not only in medical science, but in customer, consumer, patient experience, and patient empowerment trends as well. Absolutely, absolutely, Yorke. So um, to, to say as it is, uh, the healthcare industry has always treated patients as patients, but patients are also consumers. Consumers uh, expect and deserve the best possible convenience as well, uh, not uh, just care that's excellent uh, uh, within hospitals, but because healthcare is complex, it's hard to navigate, then they deserve that better convenience and the digital tools are now available to disrupt that, to make it so much easier and therefore we will invest heavily and embrace uh, digital technologies to do so. Cool. Kenneth, in, in Hong Kong, you, you have your own app. You, you talked a little bit about how, how is your response directly on the ground with patients you have in Hong Kong? Or, or does this actually even help you acquiring patients from China? Thank you, Yok. Um, 
I totally echo what um, Calvin was saying just now. Um, going digital for us in Hong Kong, with the app particularly, uh, has helped us in improving the total patient experience. Uh, in the past, people tended to be relatively conservative when it comes to healthcare, but with the proliferation of these mobile devices, like the phone you were holding up just now, people's acceptance of uh, digital health has greatly increased. Um, but then we must also be aware that it's, just, that it's not just the patients, but also the accept, acceptance of the doctors to actually see and monitor patients virtually as well. So we are actually looking at the whole utilization and the development of the app holistically, not just with the view of doing telemedicine or virtual consultations, but also other digital experience and services. So uh, as you mentioned, we launched our patient app we called the My Glen Eagle Smart Health last year. Uh, the aim was to make healthcare more accessible and to empower patients as well to manage their own outpatient healthcare needs more easily. So through this development and on launching of the function in phases, we have now completed what we call the phase one. And in the phase one, we included the online booking for our patient visits and also not just for your own self, but also for, for your family members. So actually through one app, you can actually cater for your kids or for your parents at home and everyone else. So there is this care mode, which is very, very important for us. So one person can actually take care of the whole family. And then through this app, you can actually also check the waiting time at our 24 hours outpatient and emergency. Importantly, it also allows you to access your own medical records especially the viewing of the lab results and diagnostic reports and health education information. So these are very important functions that we have included in our phase one and it's already launched. More functions are in the pipeline and we hope to launch the second batch in around six months time. Uh, these new functions will include online payment, which is very important again, because uh, as all everyone would know, while you're sick and you still have to sit and wait for payment is something very agonizing. So if there is this opportunity of, of actually completing the payment online, a patient can leave after taking the medications without having to sit and wait for another maybe 10, 20 minutes just for the payment. So this is also very important. And obviously, we want to also do the teleconsultation through this app too. So more convenience is, uh, to patient is one aspect. And the use of the app has also shifted some of the non-clinical tasks uh, to digital as well. So previously, some of the jobs taken up by healthcare staff are now going digital. For example, um, they don't need to do, as I mentioned, the, a lot of the uh, handling of the bills and such stuff. So therefore, the same staff can actually spend more time on patient care. And regarding your uh, question about mainland China, we have actually, for the past two years, already having some synergy with our sister hospitals and clinic chains in Shanghai. So we have been uh, developing a second opinion service for particularly in radiology. So we are through this uh, service, been able to provide uh, a kind of like um, second opinion for our uh, colleagues in, in mainland China. We are now also um, working with them to develop a teleconsultation service for very highly specialized services uh, that we have in uh, Glen Eagles, Hong Kong because of our partnership with the university. And therefore we, were, we would be able to provide them with highly specialized care, for example, in spine care or in oncology care where they might not have the same sort of uh, expertise in, in Shanghai. Uh, mentioned just now is also the mobility of the patients. So through this app, patients have their medical records on their hands in their handheld mobile phones. So it means that these patients can carry their records anywhere. Uh, in, the, in the event that they might need medical support in anywhere else other than Hong Kong, through this app, they can actually show their lab results, the allergy records, and some of the simple radiology reports also to their doctors anywhere, uh, anywhere in the world. In particular, recently, we have also launched the uh, capability of uh, uh, providing COVID, te uh, COVID test results, the PCR results electronically on the app. So these clients, um, they can, before they fly off to anywhere else in the world, they can actually, through the app, be able to access their uh, COVID test results and show to, let's say, immigration people when they go into different countries and through different airports. So, what, I mean, you've, you've, uh, you, you, you've clearly come a long way. You've made a lot of progress. Sachin earlier mentioned remote monitoring and how this connects to my app and then speaks to a, to a doctor at the hospital. Are, are you actually working on solutions around that? And, and when is that 
when can this be real? Um, yeah, it is already real. Um, we have this uh, po program again with Dr. Go um, to actually provide hypertension care for patients. So for these patients, they can uh, have their blood pressure monitored at home. These data will be uploaded to the cloud services and our clinical staff can actually real-time view these blood pressures. But of course, it's actually very expensive to do it real time. What we usually do is that we have these blood pressure data downloaded to our uh, uh, computer system, and therefore our clinical staff can review it maybe once every few days. So in the past, hypertension patients will have to see a doctor maybe in once every eight to 12 weeks and get their medications. But now, in between these eight to 12 weeks, they actually have their regular records of blood pressure being reviewed by the doctors and by the, by the nurses. And therefore, if there are any kind of like change in condition or, or difference in, in blood pressure that they need a, a adjustment of the medication or the dosages, it can be done before the actual consultation. So it's an enhanced care and as, uh, uh, improving the health of the patient and also through teleconsultation services, we'll be able to provide them with such a sort of enhanced service without having them coming into the hospital or to our clinics. Wow, that, that, sounds, that sounds amazing. It also sounds like a, a lot of investment. I, I, I heard the number, someone say like $100 million, we want to invest into this. But so Sachin, can, can anyone actually earn money with this? I mean, in the end, we're not doing this for fun. We, we want to, we're still a commercial enterprise. Yeah, yes, Jörg. Uh, I, I think if you look at the digital health, uh, this is going to be a $600 billion value pool by 2024. So the value at stake is very high and it is even accelerating now. So it could be even faster, faster than that. So that's number one point. The second point I would mention also is within Asia, there are 1 billion people who have touched some of these digital health ecosystems already. So this is for here, this is for real, and there is a lot of value at stake um, uh, for different players to, uh, uh, players to uh, uh, play in, right? And in our view, this is also not something, the, the way the transformation take place is very much here and now, I think as we were just talking. We believe over the next three to five years itself, uh, digital health will transform the way healthcare would be delivered in countries. It would be anchored around digital health ecosystems. It would be around patients rather than hospitals, as uh, Kevin mentioned earlier as well, with patient at the center and a set of services that seamlessly connect, right? And to your, uh, uh, just broadly now taking it to, just, just from in terms of the returns perspective, um, we have done work on, uh, on this space with various uh, players and the ROIs of digital interventions that we are looking at has been traditionally even more attractive than some of the other ideas that are in the pipeline. So whether those initiatives are enablers in the existing business to provide better care, or whether these initiatives are anchored around sort of building almost a new business, which is digital healthcare, uh, in, in both of these cases, uh, the ROI is very, uh, very attractive. So to your question, yes, uh, the value pool is incredibly attractive. And that's why investors are going very aggressively behind it. There, there is a 14 billion of VC money that has gone into it in, in the very recent past, uh, almost doubling from the uh, previous year. So the amount of money that is going, going into, into this uh, also gives, gives to the point that there is a, there is a value to be uh, generated. Come back with the number you said at the beginning. The market is how many rev million in revenue? 600 billion. Uh, 600 billion, billion revenue uh, uh, by? 2024. By 2024, Globally. and yes. we have 14 billion VC investment going into this. So at, at least there are people who find this is attractive and, and uh, needs attention by investors. Now I have a couple of questions that have come up here already. And, and the first one addresses uh, something that I find personally really, really important. And that is about how do actually our staff, our colleagues, uh, our frontline uh, uh, service providers, how do they actually stay current? How can they cope with this where in the past they've learned all about nursing and taking care of the patient, and now they also need to get into a digital agenda. Do, do we help 
people in this journey, Kelvin? Yes, we do and we, we will. Uh, so I think there are different uh, staff uh, or different functions, right? Uh, so in, in the frontline space, uh, definitely in terms of how we interact with our customers, uh, our staff who are ac interacting with our patients on a day-to-day -day basis will, will learn that there are now new methods of interacting with our patients. Patients will have more information, they want to have more information, uh, and so forth, they have to adapt to that change. In the um, operations uh, area, uh, where we are then um, changing the way that by which we deliver healthcare services, then um, we have to upskill that in terms of know-how in using some of the digital technologies, adopting artificial intelligence, and actually also uh, data, uh, also knowledge about data science. So uh, absolutely, uh, it's a transformation that uh, healthcare as an industry has to go through. And certainly st staff will learn not just medical knowledge, but also uh, digital and data uh, science. That's, that's great. I, th I think that's really important to keep everyone on in this journey and mm -hmm. nobody loses out. I think that's important to see it as an opportunity for everybody and, and, and not just for some select functions. But one of the things that Sachin said earlier, Kelvin, was fast. This is fast. Yeah. Are we fast enough for that? So, like I said, this is not, this is not a game of digital washing. Um, this is about adopting digital for real, to transform our care, to touch lives, to remain patient-centered. So IHH, we will not adopt digital just because there is a piece of digital technology out there. Uh, yes, we must move fast, we must transform fast, but as long as we keep in mind the objectives we are trying to achieve for our patients, deliver better, convenience, continue to improve the care, and actually uh, improve the value or in fact help them to reduce the cost of care, then we remain patient-centered, then I think we don't go wrong. So what you're saying is it's not about developing this flashy app that someone can download and feel cool that he has it, it's about really developing a business model around that serves patients and adds value uh, to people so that ultimately what Sachin says, people are actually willing to pay money for it. That's right. Okay, okay. Um, Sachin, who are, the, who are the leaders in this? I mean, we are clearly one of the leaders in, in uh, the overall healthcare platform development. Who are other leaders you would say, well, that, that's, these are really state-of-the-art companies? Uh, so, as, as I mentioned earlier, the the evolution really started in, uh, for example, I, I would say U.S. Ha there have been several uh, companies that have been center of driving this innovation uh, around digital. Part of it was also because uh, they, they are peer-led uh, ecosystems, uh, right? And in that case, there was a significant focus on wellness. How do we take care of it? So that there are players such as Livongo and Teledoc that combined and they started to innovate. And there are several examples in the US that are focused and anchored around that. Now, when we talk about this part of the world, interestingly, there is a spectrum of uh, companies that are going after, uh, uh, after this area. They, there are players like insurance companies. Uh, for example, you would know Pingan, good doctor. Do, uh, he started from an insurance company uh, uh, background uh, that he started going after. There are players uh, that are hospitals such as you, Apollo, uh, that have been taking the lens as a provider. We are close to the patient and we want to, um, uh, we, we, we want to build this capability and there are a few more uh, there. And then there is a third uh, group of uh, companies that are sort of more digital uh, co companies and, and are looking to enter. So such as Tencent, for example, in China, China has, has done it, right? So that, that's the way to think about that. Uh, there are different players that are playing in this overall space, uh, 
trying to solve a similar problem, uh, right? Uh, that we want to help patient get the right care with patient at the center. Uh, and that's why it becomes very important for hospital companies that uh, a lot of hospital companies are still sort of trying to grapple with, you know, we are not technology people, right? Uh, right, and what should we do? The reality is if you don't do it, then somebody else will, uh, right? Uh, and there are examples in different countries where somebody else is indeed building uh, uh, build, building these capabilities. Okay, okay. Um, but your starting point was that most of these investments are still somewhat on the soft entry approach with wellness, with uh, all of those easier access points for consumers, likely not as much in the real hardcore medical healthcare solutions. Yeah, I gave that example more from US perspective because they are solving slightly different problem given the way healthcare system works there. When we take Asia uh, as, as an example, uh, Asia is taking very much a digital health ecosystem view on it where it is patient at the center in this particular country, right? And it's the answer is different from country to country. So answer is different from China versus Singapore, for example. In this particular country, what are the pain points uh, for the patients? What are the needs for the patient to get better quality care, more convenient care, faster care, right? Um, and and it, it encompasses everything. So it has teleconsultation, it has drug delivery at home, it has, you know, full bottom is coming at home, it has extra record, access to records that we talked, and it also has innovation around uh, you know, some of my chronic disease uh, management and things like that. So there are a bunch of different areas where, where the work is now taking place. Uh, some of the examples that I mentioned are more still relatively easier to go after. When you start to go after chronic disease management, truly changing the behavior of the patient towards wellness, and, and uh, uh, those, are, those get even more difficult uh, uh, to implement. Uh, but the way adoption is currently taking place and how these healthcare ecosystems are emerging, uh, I, I feel very confident that in the near future, uh, we, we would have some very successful healthcare ecosystems around patient serving the need across different uh, need states. So, with our first question, we still had 10% naysayers who said, mm, not, not for me. Calvin, what do, you, what do you say to these people? Let's first acknowledge that healthcare is always a high touch industry. Um, digital technology is not going to change that. But I think there will be a space uh, for this. It will disrupt care. It will, uh, if we implement it in the right way, keeping that high touch, uh, then there will be the adoption. Maybe I uh, tell you a story that uh, close to me just happened recently because uh, my, my mom, who is uh, 75 years old, uh, she's staying in Malaysia. She, she would come regularly, regularly to Singapore, but obviously because of the lockdown, uh, the border control, that can't happen. Uh, she's a chronic disease patient. She has asthma. She has on some, lo some long-term medications. But she learned how to use Zoom. Uh, maybe you can call it early teleconsult. Uh, she still considers me as a medical doctor, so she consults me over that Zoom. She says, hey, I'm getting this cough that's more frequent at night. I can see her on screen. She's not obviously breathless. I know that cough that happens more frequently at night is usually due to an escalation of asthma. So I say, so how many doses of this drug are you taking, this serotype? She said, I'm taking once a night. I say, why don't you try twice a night? And so the next Zoom call, one month later, she says, oh, that cough has gone away at night. So there are, I think, situations that if you keep that high touch uh, uh, and in, in that system, the credibility in that system, and then digital technology becomes an enabling tool to simply make that care more uh, convenient, then uh, I think slowly the remaining uh, seven or ten percent would be willing to give it a try. And 
do you feel, I mean, look, our, our core business is brick and mortar, high intensity, people come to the hospital, get treated yeah. for uh, some serious things. But, but is this an exp expansion or an extension of this to care for people more even when they're outside or how do you position this for us? So the answer is yes. Uh, and keeping to the story that I just told, uh, clearly there will be a role for this. We will start to be able to deliver care beyond the hospital walls. Uh, as I said, uh, we have to make sure that there is that seamless transition that's enabled. Because there, in my mind, there's no such thing a, a, as a situation where all care gets transferred out, right? Uh, that's just not going to happen. But some of that care can. Repeat consults, some early triage, maybe uh, re prescription refills, uh, and certainly a lot of um, managing the information, showing information trends, maybe even remote monitoring. These are things which can be done safely uh, outside the hospital walls. From the patient's point of view, that's better care, better value from a provider like us. It will help us to serve even more patients, touch more lives, and then we create a, a hospital without wall. Great. The idea of, of prescription refill appeals to me personally and, mm. uh, because it makes it much easier to get things uh, uh, automatically or through a, a, a teleconsult service and, and even potentially get this through an online pharmacy mm. uh, delivered and, and realized. K Kenneth, you, you spoke about your app. Look, we want to see it. Well, what can you do with it? Sh show us. Sure. Uh, shall we play the video now and I will try to run you through some of the details. So you can see that everyone can actually get on the telephone in their office and the comfort of their office and be able to see a doctor. So I here try to log in into the system. I confirm that I'm a resident in Hong Kong and I'm currently in Hong Kong. That is important because of the malpractice problem. And I will now then enter some of my symptoms, my allergies, and how I would like to have my drugs delivered. So next I pick an appointment and I pick a doctor. And then I also confirm how I would like to pay for it, maybe through credit cards or maybe other in other cases by insurance. So then I received a link to the actual consultation. When the time comes, I actually just punch the link and I'll be able to see the doctor through this teleconsultation. Did, did he help you? Did, did he solve, your, did he sol solve your, medical, your medical problem in this case? Well, in this particular situation, yes, I'll be showing you the drugs that I actually received. The important thing is that um, about this part that we mentioned just now is about the drug delivery. So our pharmacists not just prepare the drugs, but also some of the instructions on how actually to take the drugs. And they put it in a sealed envelope where they will be delivered to me. So you can see that it's sealed. I open it myself. And through scanning of the barcode on, the, uh, on each prescription, I understand how to actually use the drugs. And subsequently, I can also review what drugs I've used and also um, the, the previous appointments that I've made. So I have everything in my hand, basically. Great, excellent. And, and how, much, how much did we charge you for that? Um, well, as my boss is here, I must say that I actually pay for it myself. It was 350 Hong Kong dollars. <laughs> and it includes three days of medication. It's actually pretty good. 350 Hong Kong dollars, the, that's... That's not unreasonable. That's, if it's a good doctor uh, appointment for, for good value advice. That's right. That's right. I guess it, it's, it's kind of like similar to the amount that we usually pay for episodic diseases, even when you go for a physical consultation. Right. So what we try to do is that we make sure that other than a slight change in the way that you get the consultation, the rest of the experience is actually a lot smoother. And, therefore, and even the amount of money that you have to pay will be similar. 
So one of the one of the things I was thinking, those ten percent that are not so hooked on yet, and maybe some of the others, is about data security and and data and look, we're all out there we're on LinkedIn or Facebook, and and we all talk about data privacy. It appears to be a potential barrier for people to adopt this technology. Sachin, how, how do companies deal with that? Do, do you have any examples? Yeah, and no, I think it's a very good question and it's a, it's a complicated question as well, but an incredibly important question to answer. Because we have seen this in uh, other industries, if you take banking, if you take consumer, uh, 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 for example, um, right? This has been quite at the center of uh, uh, the debate. And there have been a lot of reg regulations, for example, such as GDPR and others where the, this have been even more uh, at the center for debate. So the way to think about the, the whole data privacy and cybersecurity, which goes hand in hand in some ways, um, is sort of, first of all, number one is how do you build and manage it effectively? And number two is how do you think about the regulatory uh, framework uh, uh, around it, especially on some of the countries where in Asia, where this is, uh, this is really at the early stage. And, and, and when we talk about build and manage the, the first part, right? Essentially, this is, about, uh, this is about anchoring it in a way that you are truly minimizing the risk to the data. The data is stored in the right way with the right formats and right uh, latest standardization uh, approach as well as the consent uh, with, the, with the patients. But also from the perspective of just cybersecurity, there, there, are, there is a right uh, sort of elements in place from the perspective of um, from the perspective of how do you minimize the risk and how do you quickly act on any incident, right? So both the, both, both, both the, uh, both, both the things really need to go hand in hand. And within that, there are a couple of different areas that get addressed and very commonly uh, organizations are investing behind it, right? Whether it is technology and architecture you do, right? Because it's in the healthcare ecosystem, you start participating with players outside. So it becomes very important that you have the right architecture and a stable uh, core of the technology that can seamlessly connect with the right standards. But on top of it, there are processes that you need to follow internally. And there's also a point of uh, education and training of the everyone involved uh, in the data, right? So some of these components come in place to safely handle the data uh, and, and uh, do, do it in a secure, uh, secure, secure way. And there is a point of, in some of these countries, as, as this is a relatively new thing, there are a lot, of, lot to learn from some of the other countries as well in terms of how the framework and the regulation should be developed in terms of uh, overall data privacy uh, and, and the accountability, uh, 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 accountability towards keeping the data safe and doing all the protocols towards it. So these are a couple of uh, things I would suggest in addressing, addressing right. the points uh, right. and very commonly used by some of the other industries who have been at it for quite some time. Right, I mean, in our internal discussions, I, I, I heard the word de-identification uh, used quite frequently as one of, the la of yeah. those protection layers that, that you, were just, you were just mentioning. Uh, we, we have a second question here for the audience, uh, and, and it, it's basically around, will digital health be the new norm? Or is this just some fads and fancy and look in the end, people want to see their GP and uh, it, it will all go back to normal at one stage. Maybe while, while we're waiting f for the answers, uh, one question is here, uh, do you have a department? Uh, how is this, how are you organized around innovation? Uh, do you have a, a a department around that or to look into digitalization or new processes? How, how is that? Yes, we do. Um, so IHH has a innovation office. Um, we have a small team of people there. Their job per se is not to innovate the healthcare by itself, but it's helping all of us, uh, helping to facilitate uh, innovation in all of us. As our staff here will know, we actually launched an innovation challenge uh, this year. Um, I'm very pleased that almost a hundred over teams participated from across all our geographies. A lot of uh, great ideas, uh, how you improve care at a point where you deliver it to 
patients. Uh, and uh, the, 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 I think the finalists are being selected and actually the finals uh, for that innovation challenge is coming up just uh, end of the month. That's, that's, that's fantastic. And I, 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 I'm actually quite surprised and, engaged and, and encouraged by all the ideas that came out, even the discussions we have with Yusuke around innovation and startups and investments there. Actually, really exciting, really exciting stuff. Now, the answers are, uh, well, 88% believe this is here to stay. This will be the new norm. And 12% do not believe this. And I think this dovetails a little bit to what Sachin said earlier. There is an overwhelming trend to say uh, digital solutions will enter the space and potentially disrupt. Now, how the disruption will look like, we don't exactly know uh, yet. But let's go back to Dr. Anywhere. Kelvin, how much have you invested and how, how much have you gotten out of it? So we took a minority stake in Dr. Anywhere, uh, not a majority stake. Uh, the key reason why we wanted to do that uh, is to create that strategic partnership. I had explained earlier that uh, we saw their capabilities as complementary uh, to what we had in Singapore. Uh, Dr. Anywhere is one of the fastest growing uh, health e-commerce platforms, offering some wellness services. You can buy some health products online, but also helping to navigate and, and book services. Today, you can book our specialist services via Doctor Anywhere. So I think that's just a great example of uh, coming back to what I said. Uh, we make uh, investments in digital technology, strategic investments, uh, because we want to remain focused on uh, creating that whole ecosystem using the strengths that we have, but getting complementary strengths and actually making that care better, more seamless for our patients. Okay, okay. Kenneth, we, we had our budget call the other day and, and one of the line items in there was something that's called Project Digify and, and IT and, and all kinds of different things. Uh, and, and, and how do you look forward into that building that capability, and how does it translate into your connection with China? Thank you, Jörg. Uh, it certainly wasn't an easy thing to prepare that budget. Um, but I must say that the Hong Kong team is very much in line with what Calvin was saying, that the group's direction uh, is to continuously to innovate and develop uh, digital healthcare in the, in the, in, with, the, uh, with the mindset of using the patient in, right in the center. So in terms of healthcare digitalization and transformation, with the ultimate aim of making quality care is to make it more accessible and bringing greater patient experiences. So uh, Hong Kong being part of the group's online and digital ecosystem, which you mentioned, the name is Digify, the project. Uh, it involves numerous in initiatives to the use, uh, relating to the use of the data, uh, building technology uh, capability and platforms, and also in some of the situation, external partnerships as well. Uh, for us, to bring the different initiatives of life is actually very important. Uh, and with the budget that um, we are now going to work on several things, both in-house and also working with partners. One of the things we are planning to do is to upgrade our existing portals. So it's not going to be just a website. So previously, people look at website as being an information portal where you get different sorts of information and people through the information ju might just kick through and use some of the services. But now things can be a lot more interactive with patients and there could be many more online functions such as making payments, accessing medical health records and many other different kind of like uh, uh, functions. So we'll be doing it, uh, investing into revamping our portals. The second thing is something that I've talked about just now is our patient app. So we'll continue to enhance the capability of this app, integrating it further into the digital platform and also the care pathway. This is something very, very important uh, because um, uh, relating to the question just now uh, in the poll, whether it's going to be a new normal, 
uh, when I discuss with my uh, colleagues in, in, in uh, who are doctors and also with friends who are working in university, the way they, the way they look at it is that uh, this digital transformation is not actually just going to transform healthcare itself, but also many ways that a consultation takes place. But then this is not a new thing to healthcare, to be honest, like what you alluded to right from the beginning. Um, healthcare business has always been innovative. Um, the example that I would like to quote is that um, me being in cardiology uh, uh, services previously, um, doctors will use stethoscope to listen to patients' hearts and try to detect for any murmurs and therefore any abnormalities in patient hearts. But these days, we still use our stethoscope, but then we complement by using uh, technologies like echocardiogram, which is an ultrasound specifically for the heart. And therefore, there is a lot more accuracy and a, a much greater enhancement in diagnostics for patients. So this is the concept that we're, the way that we're looking at telemedicine and telehealth right now. It's going to disrupt healthcare, but it's not going to replace the high touch that we provide for patients, but it, just in different sorts of way. So this is how we look at how we're going to use the patient app and the portal to, to uh, enhance our services for patients. But additionally, something that another question that was raised just now is about staff. Um, the digital savviness of staff is also a very, very important point. Um, you cannot expect even very experienced clinical staff suddenly become comfortable with using new technologies, which are in fact quite uh, providing quite different models of care. So, so therefore, with the budget that we have planned right now, it's not just into technology stuff or the building of apps or portals, but also into training for staff so that they will be digitally savvy and also some of them will be able to provide direct support to, to, the, to the patients or their families. Um, and therefore, we are almost like providing some sort of digital genius to provide on-site and also help to patients. And then lastly, about our link up with mainland China. Um, to that end, I must say that uh, there's something that we have not really touched on so far. It's about social media. Uh, Hong Kong, uh, being Hong Kong, we have always been kind of like international and we have been using Facebook, Instagram and Telegram. But for the mainland China market, which honestly for Hong Kong, our biggest potential is still the mainland China clients, specifically those in the Greater Bay Area. We do have plans to enhance our official WeChat platform to serve our mainland clients. So these are the areas that we'll be investing in with the budget that we have for the coming few years. Okay, seems, uh, seems the budget is well allocated then. Okay. Let me do kind of one of the questions that, that actually dovetails with what you what you said, Kenneth, and maybe Calvin, you can help us. Uh, can healthcare or can digital uh, digitalization of healthcare prevent wrong results of patients' conditions and treatment? How, how does that play? And I, I recall a, a meeting we had the other day around this echocardiogram. How, how does digitalization help getting to better results? It can help uh, and it will help the technologies that are evolving will be such that it actually elevates medical capabilities or elevates the human ability to deliver care, make diagnosis. Uh, a example that's happening now is in the, in the world of radiology and even pathology. So radiologists have to read films, right? Uh, whether it's CT scans or MRI, there's already evidence that uh, artificial intelligence using machine learning to, to learn many, many X-ray films or MRI, uh, X-ray films for a start. Uh, they can actually pick up abnormalities or pick up things uh, in the X-rays which are abnormal for the patient in a more, accur uh, more accurately or with less errors than a human can. Uh, and that's where uh, uh, machine learning is at, and I think that's only going to continue to improve. Okay, fantastic. Maybe we just we just stay with some of the questions. Um, this question around the capex that we're allocating towards digital healthcare, and and uh, I'm coming back to the hundred million US dollars that we plan to invest over the next couple of years. Where where, where will you use that money for? So. Firstly, I'm a bit uh, reluctant to put a marker out there, $100 million. We will invest heavily, $100 million definitely. Uh, reluctant because the last time I said we'll double our ROE in five years uh, and then 
uh, suddenly we, we have done that and people say, well, uh, what's next? Uh, it was, was that the DB all and, and all. So obviously not the same with the $100 million investment. I think that's a marker or sort of estimate we think uh, we'll invest over the next three years, but the journey won't stop there. What will we invest in? Uh, firstly, uh, in what we call the digital foundation, we want to digitize our processes uh, existingly um, such that we are, uh, firstly, uh, it helps to improve the speed of those processes. It helps to collect uh, uh, data and obviously uh, ensuring that uh, it's, it's in fully private, confidential way, anonymized when we need to analyze it make the digital foundation so that it then enables us to do the next layers better. Now, the second layer then is uh, that digital, using digital technologies to interface with our patients better. I already said that we will always remain high touch. So we will be both high touch and high tech because uh, all the examples that have been talked about in terms of how we can use digital technologies to make things more convenient for patients, we'll do that, we'll invest, we'll build that layer. The third layer then uh, is investing in deep capabilities uh, which uh, improve care. These are in the realm of artificial intelligence, data, uh, uh, data analytics or data driven decision making so that we can then, uh, as I said, improve, enhance our capabilities in terms of the diagnostics and care, and at the same time, bring our ability to deliver our processes down to the in, uh, individual patient, right? Because really every patient is different. Every patient with diabetes, diabetes may be a common condition, but each patient having diabetes is a different patient with a, a, a different situation. So those are the three layers, and that's how we invest. Uh, definitely 100 million over the next few years, and uh, we're not stopping there. Wow, that's a that's a, 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 a pretty clear message. What, what I what I like in this whole discussion is the recurring theme about patient empowerment and patient centricity. That that is uh, something I think we'll hear a lot more about. We have a couple of more question uh, questions. So allow me to be uh, a couple of minutes over the over the time. Uh, one question is around current regulations around data protection uh, and are we prepared for transformation and disruptive growth on digital health care? I don't know, Sachin, you, you have a word on that? Yeah, I think it's very much in line with what I said earlier. There's a lot that needs to be done on the uh, regulation side in this part of the world, uh, uh, right? We, we are not fully there yet. Uh, as stakeholders, the key stakeholders, you should participate uh, in, in making the change and shaping it the right way with the right principles uh, in, in mind. Uh, so so th th there, is, there is work that needs to happen in collaboration with regulators across different countries in Asia. Okay, cool. There was one question around uh, telemedicine and, and, and if we expand this whole digital channel and ecosystem to uh, an audiologist or to other healthcare services, maybe not through telemedicine, but tie them into this ecosystem. Kenneth, do you have plans to expand this to other healthcare providers that can be part of this network? Um, thank you, Jörg. Um, we do not have solid plans yet, but to be frank, we are always exploring this opportunity. There are two areas that we are looking into. Obviously, one is the teleradiology that I've mentioned just now. So that's not too difficult because there is not a kind of like a timeliness concern on that. Um, the second thing that we are looking into the possibility of developing, it's also the what we call the uh, second opinion services for different parts of uh, maybe the Greater Bay Area or even mainland China partners of our own uh, company. So this is an important area because um, uh, similar to, to what we were talking about in terms of data privacy, doctors really cannot uh, practice cross-border in most situations in, in, in all over the world. So this second opinion service, or in some situations people call it the case, case conference uh, kind of like arrangement, uh, actually makes a uh, doctor in different countries a, being capable of providing care to uh, patients in different parts of the world, as long as there is an anchor of another service provider in that country. So 
we are actively looking into the possibility of actually doing that with partners, let's say, in the Greater Bay Area. There is also this third very remote possibility, though the technology is already here, it's about telepathology as well. So um, pathologists, honestly, all around the world is in short supply too. And their expertise are really well, well sought after most of the world. So um, being able to let uh, let's say a biopsy a cut from a patient immediately several hours after the the surgery would actually provide a lot more information so these are the areas that we will be looking into okay that, that sounds fantastic so it's something that really expands and will keep growing uh, uh, as soon as the delivery platforms uh, uh, have been have been identified um of course, one question is how, how large do you think digital healthcare component could be uh, in the growth of our hospital business in the long run? Maybe I'll take that. Uh, um, if we listen to what we have been talking about, um, the technologies have the ability to enhance care, leapfrog care, to do to take our healthcare service delivery to a level of uh, convenience and abilities uh, that wasn't really there uh, without these technologies. That's one recurring theme. The second is that it's my firm belief that these technologies will enable us to do it in a less capital intensive way um, because uh, the, the traditional healthcare model is relatively capital intensive. You always have to come into a hospital um, to get something done. You have to take up the specialist time directly uh, uh, and so on. And so therefore, it will actually uh, improve uh, uh, or it reduce that, help to reduce that capital intensity at the same time, improve things, uh, improve care for the patient. So if, if you, Think about that then, um, this journey, it'll, it'll be a long journey. In fact, probably it's going to be a never ending journey. Um, the explosion of the technologies uh, and increasing capabilities of those technologies to do what I just said, make care better, uh, at the same time reduce that uh, intense uh, capital intensity is something that we, we will embrace so it will be a big feature uh, in IHS journey over the next uh, couple of years and uh, uh, I imagine it will be beyond that as well and I, I remember the 600 billion that you mentioned uh, such in in terms of what the size of the mm -hmm. cake is so there's a really material growth potential uh, there in which uh, we want to tap there's a question around cost savings. Sachin, is, is cost savings also a consideration? Yeah, so cost savings has been part of the consideration. Um, so there have been three reasons why digital healthcare has, has, has been explored always. Number one was cost saving. Uh, number two is providing better convenient care. And number three has been sort of patient centricity as we talked. We have done some work on the cost saving. The answer obviously differs from country to country in the health system because health systems are complex depending on public versus privately funded and all that. But we did some work on this in Europe, Germany and some of the other countries. And if I remember from that work, uh, there was up to around 10% of cost savings opportunities across different levers, as I mentioned earlier, uh, uh, that, that could be, uh, could, could be, uh, could be an opportunity uh, uh, to, as you leverage uh, digital healthcare. Uh, so, so, so that is from that example, obviously the answer would differ for different countries and different health systems. But it is definitely one of the top three levers. So, so, so there is opportunity in, in delivering cost savings throughout the healthcare systems in applying some of these technologies. One of the questions here is probably a, a more ethical, uh, has a more ethical component. It, it is the question, where does digital care end and where does the personal care continue so where's the line? Where do you draw the line in digitalization? I don't know, Kelvin, do you have a thought? It's, it's, there's probably not an answer to it, but maybe some thoughts. Hmm. I think the moment 
the patient feels a sense uh, of lack of credibility or lack of trust, I think that's where the, the seamlessness that I talked about is lost. Uh, and then the model will have been wrong. Uh, that means then you're imposing an excessive uh, burden on the patient, right? It's sort of flipped the other way around. Then you ex you're supposed to use the digital technologies to make it more convenient, easier, uh, make the patient feel better in that whole journey. But if it's flipped the other way around, then suddenly, <laughs> wow, it becomes difficult to navigate. I don't understand what's going on. Uh, and I suddenly feel a, a, a uncertainty or distrust in the system. Then I think the that's wrong and that's when it's it's not person enough uh, then it's no more high touch and high tech uh, it's tech for the sake of tech uh, and, and uh, maybe then it, uh, that, that's not what we should do and, and, I, and I'm sure uh, to get a very complicated or difficult lab result being emailed to you or uploaded in your mailbox that, that's unlikely very sensitive or mm -hmm or respectful to the patient. Uh, so I think there are areas where we need to uh, be clear. Some things will need to be in person uh, because that's what it ultimately is. It's a person we are dealing with uh, and we need to find mm -hmm. ways how to keep this patient in the center of anything we do in this journey. We're 10 minutes over. We've basically gone through uh, all the questions um, a couple of questions around legality. I'm, I'm not sure we have the experts here on the call uh, to be, be really clearly answering this, but certainly something we should be addressing. We'll find a way how to get back to, the, uh, to all the questions uh, through our uh, uh, web channels. I want to thank all of you for joining and dialing in today. Um, this has been a, a really insightful uh, panel chat. Thanks, Sachin, for joining us from the outside. Thanks, mm -hmm. Kenneth, to Hong Kong uh, uh, for being with us today. And Kelvin, thanks for taking time out of your schedule uh, to speak to us here today. Um, thanks, everybody, for participating so actively. We're welcoming your feedback. What can we do better in these uh, events? How can we answer your questions better? Maybe someone comes up with some good ideas on new topics. What should we do in a couple of months when we have series three of this? Uh, and I want to thank you. I want to thank the panel uh, for joining uh, this last uh, hour and spending time with us. Thank you very much.